Hello? There we go. Good morning, Lane Prairie. Good morning. Well, we are so happy to be in the house of the Lord today. And so let's start off with some scripture reading. If you don't, if you're willing and able and you don't mind, would you stand for the scripture reading and read along with me from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature and the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Amen to that. And so let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another day, for the start of a new week. Lord, for an opportunity to start this week off with gathering together with your, your children, Lord, your, our family in Christ. Lord, we ask that this morning, Lord, that you would look down and be pleased with our assembly, Lord, that you would hear our hearts sing louder than our voices, Lord, that you would uh, be pleased with the way we study the word as well as sing praises to you. You are worthy. We love you. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world hallelujah it's your blood
as we uh, come together today. If you have a copy of Scripture, I'd ask you to join me. We've made it to Acts chapter 9 today. We're going to cover a good portion of this um, text today, but um, as you're going there, you know, uh, you might not know this about me, but um, coming into my junior year of high school, I'd kind of figured out what I wanted to do with my life. And so Ricky Fuchs had decided that he was going to be a physical therapist because they made money, um, and uh, I wanted to do that. And so I'd already uh, knew kind of uh, a, a couple schools that I wanted to go to, applied to both, got into one, realized I couldn't afford one of them. Uh, and then so I decided I was going to the other one. So I was in uh, the pre-physical therapy program a kind of summer of my uh, junior year going into my senior year, I knew what I was doing. I, through my junior year, I knew what I was doing. But something happened in January of 1998 of my uh, junior year, and that was the point that in my life that I went from uh, being an attender of church to being a born-again believer, and so in the midst of that, I still continued. I got saved my junior year, and so I'm sorry, like, okay, so I, hey, I'll be a, a saved physical therapist now. And so I continued to pursue down that path, and along the way, God was working in my life and, and calling me towards ministry, and I was being reluctant to that, much like Moses saying, hey, I'm not good with the words, God, uh, so that's not for me. But praise God, he put a student pastor in my life and his wife who lived out in the country by where we did. His wife was my Spanish teacher, and they just began, just continued to disciple me and speak truth into me. And then finally, after my senior year of high school at camp that night, the Lord called me to ministry. And, and, I, and I, it was one of those, here am I, Lord, send me moments. It was as if the Lord, through his word, said, I come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And at that point, I yielded. And so I, I had a plan for my life, but the, here's the thing that happens, and what we're going to see in our text today is just the transformational power of the gospel and how God intersects our lives, and it can really turn everything that we have planned apart from Christ upside down. And so we're going to see that in the life of Saul today. We were introduced to him a couple chapters back as one who stood there when... Um, oppressing the church when, when they're there, when they're, they're preaching the gospel and Stephen is there giving his dissents. Remember, it says Saul stood there in agreement as he was stoned to death. And so Saul comes back up, and we're going to see Saul within this chapter go from the persecutor to the proclaimer. And so I want us to see that in our text today, and we're just going to kind of walk through this, this narrative, the story of, uh, of Saul's transformation and see where he was and where he ended up. And then um, at the end, we're going to take a, some time and see really what happens when our lives, when a life of a person is intersected with Jesus in the gospel. But look with me in uh, Acts chapter 9, starting in verse uh, 1 through 9, we're going to see this kind of interaction between Saul and Jesus. Look at what it says. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples. And the, the idea of that word there is it's snorting. This is angry, right? You've seen the old bull who's mad and he's snorting and stomping. This is Saul. He, he is this adamant against the church, against what we're going to see here is referred to as the way. Those who are proclaiming Jesus, not just Jesus as the Messiah, but Jesus resurrected and exalted at the right hand. And he is angry and he's against this. He's saying they're blaspheming. And so Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him for the synagogues at Damascus. Damascus was about 150 miles away. On foot, it would have been about a six-day journey to go there. And this is the, the Roman, the capital of the Roman province of Syria was Damascus. Still there to this day, all right? That city is still there. And another thing we're going to see about that city a little, little later on in, in the text about a road, that road is still there, kind of a main thoroughfare through the town. And so he, he goes to the high priest, and he's asking uh, for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way. 
This is referring to, to believers in Jesus, those who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, those that believed and were proclaiming that, like Stephen, like the apostles, that Jesus not only died and was buried, but was raised again. And, and so he, he says, I, I need letters so that if I found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up, enter the city, and it will be told to you what to do. And the men were traveling with him, stood speechless, hearing the voice and seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. And so we have this encounter of Saul and who we find out what, what Saul likely thinks initially is just uh, uh, an encounter with a, 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 a heavenly message. He, he doesn't know. He asks who it is, all right? We, we see this throughout Scripture that there's a bright light and a voice. And so uh, Saul would have said, you know what? This is a message from heaven. This was something that happened from time to time, and he would have been aware of. And, and so he asks, is it, who is this? Is this, is this theophany? Is this a God appearing? Is this one of his messengers, an angel? What, what is going on? In fact, we see this encounter, and it's interesting that this encounter, this is one of three times that it's recounted in the book of Acts. It happens in Acts 22 and Acts 26. It also is recounted, and we see some more um, uh, details about it in each of those things. This is in the middle of the day. We find that in one of the other accounts. And so he's going. A bright light shines. It's noon. It's midday, and it says it's brighter than the sun. And so what does he do? Like you or I would, if we had a bright light and we couldn't see, we'd fall down. He fell to the ground, and then he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I imagine Saul in his mind immediately, like the, uh, there he, he's got to be thinking, it's like, well, who, who, who am I persecuting that God would come and, and say this to me? Who of God's genuine believers and followers am I persecuting? And then he says, it's me, Jesus, who you're persecuting. And I I've tried to think through this week, what went through Saul's mind at that moment? And say, well, Jesus, there, there's a whole lot of things. And so automatically, when, when Jesus says this to him, he says, by persecuting my children, my followers, my believers, you're persecuting me. Think about this. They, they, the apostles and the disciples had been proclaiming that Jesus was resurrected, he, that he was alive and exalted at the right hand. And so at this time for Jesus to be there amongst them, he had to go, that's the truth. And, and I don't know about you, I, I, I feel like almost for him, I get like this sick feeling in my stomach um, to be like, man, I was really, really, really wrong. And so he's here, this encounter, he falls why are you persecuting? Who are you, Lord? And that Lord there could be an indication, uh, uh, just a respectful term. He, he realizes this is an encounter from heaven that's taking place. And so he says, who, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. And he gives him instruction. He identifies himself. He says, it's me, Jesus, resurrected and exalted, that even though you're persecuting my believers, you're persecuting me. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to get up and go. He hadn't made it to Damascus yet. Get up and go to Damascus now. And then once you get there, it'll be told you what you should do. He's got a choice. He's on the road to Damascus, but he's at a proverbial fork in the road, right? What am I going to do at this point? Where am I going to go from here? What am I going to do? Is this real? Is this really Jesus? Am I seeing things? Am I hearing things? But he gets up. And he goes, it tells us in the, in the text that the men that were traveling with him stood there speechless, hearing no voice, but seeing no one. They, they heard something that maybe they're, they're there and they saw nothing like Paul saw, and they saw just Paul fall to the ground and begin to speak, and they thought, this guy's crazy. 
They, they heard something, whether it was that voice and a sound, and, and it's like, I, we, they don't know what's going on. But I think it's important that they're here because there's eyewitnesses to what happens in Saul's life. They're eyewitnesses that something happened on the road. They're eyewitnesses once he makes it to Damascus, as we're going to see, that there's something different about Saul. And so they're there. They, they heard voice, but they saw no one. And so it says Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Think about it. This rising, what was a really a rising star in the Pharisees, Saul. He, he, he was devout in every single way. He was an up-and-comer. And he goes from, I've got letters from the high priest. I've been faithfully persecuting those who are blaspheming God, those who are of the way, and I'm going to take those who escaped from Jerusalem. I'm going to bring them back so they can stand trial. And he has this encounter, and he falls down, and he gets up, and one of his major senses is gone. He can no longer see. That which he thought he saw very clearly, now he could not see at all physically. Think of what that had to do to him. Was I wrong about Jesus? I, I, I think at this point he goes, I was. I, I just saw him. I just heard him. He just spoke to me on this road. And now I've been punished. I, I don't have my sight. All the things that were probably going through his mind. It says he, he couldn't see, and so he got up. And though he had been leading these others to Damascus, they now have to take him by the arm, by the hand, and they have to lead him. The one who was the leader is now being led by others. It says they brought him into Damascus, and it says he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Whether that was fasting, some people say he was fasting, some people say he wasn't. We know uh, from the text coming up, we'll see in just a moment, that he was uh, fervently praying, and so fasting could have been, uh, along with that, he could have still just been in shock. He was just like, I don't, I, I can't eat, I can't drink, I can't see anymore. I, I, everything that I thought one way, I realize now I'm wrong. And so we see this encounter that takes place. And then verse 10 going on, down here through uh, verse 19, we, we see also in encounters with Jesus and Saul's in the mix, but we add another guy named Ananias. And this is obviously not Ananias from previously in the book of Acts because he fell over dead, right? And so this is another Ananias. But look at what the text says. It says, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. There's somebody who was there, uh, already a believer in that place, a Jew who was a believer in that place in Damascus. And it says, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here and Am I Lord? So he, he understands that this is the Lord speaking to him. Soon his name is spoken. He says, Here am I, Lord. And, and that's a sign of yielding oneself, right? We see that in Isaiah chapter 6, right? Here am I, Lord. Send me. And his response is a yielding of self. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street that is called Straight. That, that road is still there in Damascus to this day, a main part of the main city street there. And inquire at the house of Judas, all right? Again, not Judas from the Gospels, because he's no longer on the scene. A man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So we see within the text, Ananias is having this vision, but the Lord tells Ananias in this vision that Saul has had a similar version. All right, And so we, we wonder, you just remember Saul was in Jerusalem and he had got letters to go to Damascus. He had not yet arrived, but his reputation preceded him. Because what does Ananias say? He has a little bit of trepidation. He goes, as he hears this, he goes, wait a minute, I, I, I've heard about this guy. Look at what the text says. It says, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm he did to your saints. This is the first time in Scripture that believers are referred to as saints. 
at Jerusalem. And so he says, hey, Saul's reputation, we've heard about him. We don't know if there are people there that scattered and they made it as far as Damascus whenever Stephen was stoned to death. And it says they, there was the scattering and the great persecution broke out from that time. Likely the people traveled from there, but, it, but they, they knew about Saul. He said, we, we've heard about him and the harm that he's done to your saints. They knew that he had letters from the high priest to the synagogues in Damascus. There was evidently somebody that was in Jerusalem who, when Saul got the papers to go and do this, who said, I'm going to run ahead and warn somebody. Like, they, they knew it was coming, and he's there. We know he has authority from the chief priest to bind all, to arrest all who call on your name, all who are believers in you, Lord Jesus. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings to the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. And so the Lord says, I know you have reservations, Ananias. I know his reputation precedes him, but what you don't know is the encounter that he had with me on the road. And he has a purpose to be my witness to the Gentiles and to the Jews. Perhaps Ananias knew about Saul's call before Saul ever knew about Saul's call. He says he's going to be there. He's going to be my witness to Gentiles and to kings and to Jews. And when we read through the rest of the New Testament, we see that all of this comes into play. He comes before leaders. He ends all the way up before Caesar, eventually in his life. But God had a purpose and changed everything about him. And so Ananias, much like Saul, when he had that Damascus Road encounter, is at the proverbial fork in the road. What, what do I do? I, I know his reputation. I know what he's done. I know how he's treated. I know how he's harmed believers. I know how he had stood there as Stephen was stoned to death. And I know how he's coming to inflict harm and arrest other people. And, but I know what God has told me to do. And so what does he do? So Ananias departed and entered the house. His response was obedience. And after laying his hands on him, he said to him, Brother Saul, what? think about that. <laughs> the very people that he was persecuting, the very people that he was seeking to harm, the people that were being put to death, now reach out to him, physically touch him, and call him brother. The gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to transform lives drastically. One who stood in opposition as a murderer is now called brother. So it says that he came to him, he laid his hands on him, he called him brother, the Lord Jesus. And, and this is Ananias speaking. He said, hey, Jesus, he, he's proclaiming Jesus to him. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, he sent me so you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up, and he was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened from there. We see this encounter. We see the gospel. And, you know, sometimes we deal with people in life and God gets a hold and God saves somebody. And sometimes we can be like Ananias and be like, Lord, I'm a little bit skeptical of this because I know how they lived their life before. And I, I think some of that might be Ananias chastised for that but because he was obedient to what God called him to do. But we ought to accept and draw in others. God is able and willing to forgive our sins. Even to the extent of one who persecuted Jesus himself, who stood while others were murdered, stood in agreement with it, seek to do harm to him. Even that person God can reach. Sometimes I think we, we as people decide who God can reach and who God can't reach. Shame on us for that. 
And so here we, we see this. And so, so the question becomes like, hey, is, was Ananias justified? Was this genuine? Was, was Saul genuinely converted? Is he really a believer now? Is he one of the way? Is he one of the saints? And that's where we see in, in the rest of the verses from verse 20 down uh, through in our text, we're going to look to today through 31, we see fruit of that salvation by which we can judge his salvation. And so we see the ministry of Saul in Damascus in verses 20 to 25. Look at it. It says, now that for several days he is with the disciples who are at Damascus, and, and likely he's there with the disciples. These are other believers that are there, and, and probably what's asking is these are people who were disciples, who were saved, and I imagine as smart as Saul was, as much as he knew about the Old Testament, he was still putting things together. And I believe there's discipleship that's taking place in the midst of this, that he was there with them many days, and he's asking questions, and they're answering, and the Holy Spirit is working in his life at this point. And it says, and then immediately he began to proclaim Jesus. That which he stood in opposition of, that which he stood and persecuted people for doing, he was now doing. He began to proclaim Jesus. In the synagogues, much like Stephen did, and he's now in a, in a Hellenistic setting, in this Greek setting out there, and the way Stephen stood in those synagogues and proclaimed Jesus and was stoned to death for it, Saul has said, I will go and do the same thing. I'll proclaim that same Jesus as died, resurrected. In fact, he says here that he began to proclaim him, saying he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is died and buried and resurrected. He is alive, exalted at the right. And he is preaching there in these synagogues. In the same way that people had come and he had come to persecute those people, he is now standing on the other side. In verse 21, it says, all those hearing him continue to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who was in Jerusalem and destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? The implied answer is yes, it's the very same person. But Saul kept increasing in strength. He kept, as I believe, as he began to understand and the Spirit began to work in him, he began to study and be discipled. He began, he began strength in that understanding there and there. And in, he says here, who does this sound familiar to in the following verses? And confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. Sounds just like Stephen, right? Says when he was there in the synagogues, they could not answer him. And again... This is the work of the Holy Spirit, but you shall receive power, Acts 1-8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. This is what's taking place here. Verse 23, it says, when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. Now, there's some debate on many days, what that means, um, and probably there's an extended period of time that takes place here, and we, we kind of gather that from, if you look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 to 24, he says that he was in Arabia and Damascus for a period of three years. So most people say that this time period here is somewhere between about a year and a half and three years that he's there, and after a period of time, that which Saul began proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, going to the synagogues, they couldn't answer him, the exact exact same thing happened when they couldn't answer Stephen. They began to plot how they could kill him. It says they began to plot together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they were also watching at the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But the disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering in a large basket. This is the guy who was coming to down with all the, the power and the authority to come and arrest. And now he is sneaking away in a basket being lowered out of a window. L look at what's happened. And then it says, when he came to Jerusalem, he didn't immediately go to Jerusalem. This is somewhere in that year and a half to three years, this time period of him leaving. And, and Galatians tells us he went to Arabia and back to Damascus, and then he came to Jerusalem at some point. Notice what happens. Even though it's been a period of time, I'm sure stories had circulated about what happened to Saul in Damascus and the way he was preaching there. But, but look what happens when he gets there. 
When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. He began to say, hey, where are the followers of the way? Where are the saints? Where are the disciples of Jesus Christ? And he began to try and associate with them. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. They, they were like, we, we know about Saul. He's been gone for a while, but we still remember as he stood there, Stephen was stoned. To death. We, we know about him. We know that he left with letters to go arrest and persecute those that were in Damascus. And they were wary. But praise God that he raises up people like Barnabas. This is the second time Barnabas appears in the book of Acts. He shows up in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, the first time. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles. And described how he had seen the Lord on the road. Evidently at some point in the midst of of Saul coming back to Jerusalem, he had intersected with Barnabas. Barnabas was one who doesn't push people out, but is known as the son of encouragement who draws people in. And so he was one who went and he heard the testimony of Saul's uh, transformation that, that had taken place when he encountered Jesus. And he heard about how he'd met the Lord on Jesus. And he's relating this. He's standing as an intermediary to the apostles and the disciples between Saul and them to say, no, this is, this is real, this is genuine. He was born again. And he described how he had been seen on the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him. And now at Damascus, he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely and says, here, once once." Barnabas interceded, it says that he was kind of brought in and he began to move freely through the city of Jerusalem with the apostles and the disciples, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, just like Stephen was doing in those synagogues, those Greek speaking Jews. But they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren, when the apostles and disciples learned of the plot to put him to death, They brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, which is where he was from. So the church throughout all Judea, there's a summary statement in verse 31, throughout all Judea and Samaria enjoyed peace and being built up, going on in the fear of the Lord, in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and it continued to increase. And so in the narrative of Acts, Saul is going to disappear for a while. When we go back and we look through history, we realize that he was probably in Tarsus before he shows back up on the scene for probably close to about 10 years doing ministry there. And then he shows back up. We'll see him in just a couple chapters show back up. But, but we see this take place, and we see this transformation. We've seen in just these 31 verses, we've seen one go in a complete 180 degrees from where he was, right? And that's what the gospel does. And so just briefly wrapping up kind of some things here this morning is this, is this, is that I want us to understand what we see in the text today is that is when a person has a genuine encounter with Jesus, when a person has a genuine encounter with the gospel that's presented to them and their response is repentance and faith in Jesus, Jesus will change your what, your how, your where, and your why. He will change everything. He did it to me. What I was going to do, why I was going to go do it, where I was going to go do it, why I was going to go do it. He changed everything about me when my life intersected with the gospel. What we see in the text in Saul is this, is that when Jesus intersected with the lives of Saul, it changed what he was doing. When you have an encounter with Jesus, in the gospel, and you're changed, when you're born again, it will change what you do. And look at Saul. He went from the one that was the persecutor of those who proclaimed Jesus to then being the proclaimer of Jesus himself. It changed what he did. He came for the intent purpose of persecuting, of arresting, and taking them back to Jerusalem, and putting them in jail, and putting them on trial. To now he was standing and proclaiming. He was going to the synagogues, even though they're trying to kill him, and it changed what he did. You might have a plan that you've worked out for your life, but when Jesus comes in, we need to yield what we do to what he wants us to do. This is what happened to Saul. And so when Jesus 
He will change what you do. He will also change how you speak. (laughs) He is not the Messiah. He is not the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. His speech changed 180 degrees. What he spoke about, how he spoke changed. He, he was there and he was gnashing is what the text seems to, uh, there is he's angry and he's bitter against those who are of the way. And how he spoke changed drastically. The gospel will do that. It'll change how you speak. It'll change the things that you speak about, the content of what you speak about. I was a very angry person growing up. It's probably because I'm six foot five. (laughs) I went to the ball field. I didn't have a baseball game. I didn't have a football game. I went, I went to the playground, and I was there to fight. Not because anybody had done anything to me. I was angry, and I was going to fight. I don't think I've tried to fight anybody here. All right, but it's changed the way I spoke, and I was just ugly to people, and God changed that. I, I remember several years back, um, social media and those things kind of coming around and reconnecting with people. I grew up in southwest Florida, moved uh, to Texas right before my freshman year of high school, and I, I remember I got saved, and then, you know, the things that I posted about and saw that I was involved in church, and I had a person that I grew up with in Florida who sent me a message It said, you're a different person than I remember because you were kind of a jerk. (laughs) And it broke my heart. That's the transformational power of the gospel. A life that is intersected with the gospel will change what you do. It will change how you speak. And it will change where you go. Look at what happened to Saul, right? He had a plan. I'm going to Damascus. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to arrest them. I'm going to bring them back to Jerusalem. It changed where he went when his life intersected with Jesus. He made it to Damascus like he planned, but he didn't just leave immediately. He came and he started speaking differently. He started doing something different than what he had planned to do. from there, we know in Galatians, he went to Arabia, and then eventually he came back to Jerusalem. He wasn't planning to go to Caesarea and then back on to Tarsus, but when his life was intersected with Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to send you where I want you to go. That happened for me. I was enrolled, physical therapy program, Texas A&M Commerce. I went ahead and started there because by the time I was called to the ministry, it was too late. It was the summer, and I was starting in August in college. And so I said, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to take this first semester. I'm going to pray, God, are you calling me to be a vocational ministry, by vocational ministry? I'm going to take the time. And so God, through that semester, changed where I was going to go because he had intersected with my life. And he had something different for me to do. He had a different way for me to speak. He had something different in a different place. And so I ended up transferring to East Texas Baptist University where I I went and and pursued the rest of my uh, education there. I met my wife there. It'll change where you go. And so... You know, I never planned in that time to say, you know what, I'm going to go from here, from Mount Vernon, Texas, and now I'm going to go live in Waco, Texas. And I never decided ahead of time, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to leave Waco, Texas, and I'm going to go to Cedar Park, Texas, and I'm going to serve there. And I wasn't there and said, you know what, I'm going to move to Joshua, Texas. When my life intersected with Jesus, he got to decide where I go. He got to decide how I speak. He got to decide what I do. But notice one final thing. When a life is intersected with Jesus, it will also change your why. Why are you doing what you do? Well, why was Saul doing what he was doing? He, he thought he was persecuting those. He thought he was going against those who were blaspheming God. But he, he, he decided, right? He said, I'm going to go get letters. I'm going to go to Damascus. I'm going to get them. I'm going to bring them back. And what we see through the rest of the book of Acts and we see through Paul's letters is that the why was no longer his. It's no longer what Saul wanted to do. It's what the Lord wanted Saul to do. 
And so for Ricky Fuchs, my why changed. Why was I going to be a physical therapist? Because they made good money. And so now my, my why is not, hey, Ricky wants, Ricky wants to do this, Ricky wants to do that. The why for me is simply this, I want to be obedient to what God wants me to do. Wherever he calls, wherever he tells me to go, I'm going to do it. And we know through the rest of, of the writings that we see in Acts and Saul's letters, the why it took him. In fact, we see what comes to pass in the rest of this. What did Jesus tell Ananias? He told him what? He said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul got to a point where he said, I rejoice in my sufferings. Where he said, I don't consider myself worthy to suffer like Jesus. And it'll change your why. Why do we do what we do? And so here today, we, we have to look at this as the way we apply a text like this is we have to look at this and we say, if our life has been changed by Jesus, our life has met up with Jesus, we're, we're genuinely born again, then was there change in you? Did what you do change? Did how you speak change? Did where you go change? Did your why change for the things that you do in life? If there hasn't been any change in those areas, I want to encourage you, you need to strongly examine the condition of your heart. Because I don't believe a life can be intersected with Jesus and there can be someone who is genuinely born again that he doesn't change. We don't see that in the text. We don't see that in scripture. We, those are verse for today, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. The old things passed away. Behold, all things are being made new. We will not be the same when we've had an encounter with Jesus. From that point forward, there should be something that's different. What we do, how we speak, where we go, what we do, why we do what we do. Has there been a change in your life? But notice here today, what, what happens many times, and please hear me is this, is many times we try and change ourselves. We say, you know what, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. I, I, I'm going to do better. You know what, I, I'm going to change that and God's going to, right? We, we do it every December. New Year's resolutions, right? Right? We decide the things we're going to do better. We're going to decide we're going to do this or that or that or whatever. God's usually not in that equation. We're like, here's what I'm going to do. But hear, hear me today. Please, please understand, you cannot change yourself. To say that you could change yourself is, is to say that you can deal with your own sin. It says that you can remove your sin. It says that you can cover up your sin. And the scripture tells us this, is that the wages of sin is death. What your sin has brought about for you is death. It's physical death. It's spiritual death. It's eternal death, eternally separated from God. But Jesus, but Jesus, God in the flesh came and dwelt among us. He lived the life that we could not live in complete obedience to the commands of God. And though he was innocent, he went to the cross, and there he died. Not because he was guilty. He went because Ricky Fuchs was guilty. He went because you were guilty. Because you were guilty. And because you were guilty. And because you were guilty. And there he absorbed the wrath of God, removing the guilt of our sin. He died. He was buried. But praise God, he was raised again on the third day. That Jesus can and will transform your life if you'll repent. Paul, Saul, came to a point where he had to change his mind about what he believed about Jesus. That's repentance, is a change of mind. He thought one thing about who Jesus was, and then when he had an encounter with Jesus, it changed what he thought. He realized he was wrong. He changed his thinking. He turned away from his sin, confessing faith in Jesus. There are some here today that you've been trying to change things in your life that you have no power to change. 
but Jesus can and wants to. He wants to forgive you. And so in just a moment, Dalton and the others are going to come up. We're going to have a time of response. Maybe you're here today. And you find yourself at that point where you've been trying to change everything about you and it never works because it never will. And Jesus is there saying, here, I offer to you the free gift of eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, here's the gift. It's eternal life. If you'll repent, turn away from your sin and confess him as Lord, Jesus is Lord, believing in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, that you can go and be transformed in the same way that Saul was. Believer here today, there are times in our life, even though we've been genuinely born again, there have been times in our life where we take up what we do and what we say and where we go and why we do it, and we pick them back up and do them for selfish reasons. What I'm going to ask you in this time of response is this, is simply pray. Pray the words of the end of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know me. Test my heart and see if there be any anxious ways, any, any deceive, deceitful ways in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Say, just pray to God and say, God, hey, is there something that I'm doing that I'm doing for me and it's not what you would have me to do? Is there something or some way that I'm speaking that's not in accordance with you that I'm doing? Maybe I'm speaking against a brother or sister in Christ that I shouldn't be. There's some way I'm speaking that I shouldn't. Maybe I'm not speaking, maybe you're not saying anything bad, but maybe you're not being like the Barnabas who's the one of encouragement, who's standing in the gap for other believers and how you speak or say, God, is there, is there somewhere that I'm going that I don't need to go, and that could be physically, that could be mentally, that can be online. Is there some place I'm going that I shouldn't be going? Is there some place, God, that you're calling me to go that I haven't yielded myself to go? Maybe God is calling somebody in this place today saying, hey, I want you to go for me. You might not know where it is right now. Maybe God is calling somebody to ministry today. I don't know. Just like Saul was called and said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to be my witness who's going to go to the Gentiles and to the leaders and to the Jews. You're going to go wherever I tell you to go. Maybe you're here today. And God is calling you and saying, you, you are going to go where I call you to go. Man, we we would love to pray with you. We'd love to walk. We have students in our church that we're walking that path with right now. We want to walk alongside you and say, is God calling you to go into ministry? Is God calling you to go to the other side of the world and be a missionary? We don't know. You have to answer that call. But where is God calling you to go that you haven't gone? And sometimes we can be good about what we do and what we say and where we go, but the why behind it is wrong. The why behind it is, well, I know I'm supposed to do that and I don't want people to think bad about me instead of the why behind it being, hey, you know what? I want to be obedient. I want to be obedient to Jesus. The answer to any one of those, if you're not doing what you should do that Jesus wants you to do, if you're not speaking how he wants you to speak, if you're not going where he wants you to go, if you're not doing it why he wants you to do it, the response is easy. It's repentance. God, I've been selfish. Please forgive me. So I want to invite you to stand as we respond this morning. And dear friend, if you're here today, apart from Jesus, you've never yielded your life to him. You haven't been changed. We're going to be here. There'll be pastors, staff here at the front. We would love to talk to you about how you can know that you have forgiveness, that you're a life that's been transformed by the gospel. So Jesus, have your way amongst us in this time of response. Thank you for the testimony of Saul that you recorded in your word so we can see one who went from persecutor to proclaimer. Father, we see that you can take even the ones that the world says nothing good can come of them. And Father, you can change them for your purpose and for good. Father, you stand ready to forgive anyone who will repent and believe in you. So Father, move amongst us in this time of response.